Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> it's my pleasure today to introduce Rushin Jan Fryer, <clears throat> longtime practitioner, practitioner of Zen Buddhism who started uh, his practice at MZMC in 1985. He received Jukai there from Dainin Karage Roshi in 1988 and worked um, as the Tenzo and other mostly kitchen-related jobs until 1994. He attended Clouds and Water Zen Center for a couple of years, starting in 2002, and then in 2016 he became a member of the Hokyoji practice community, of which the Hokyoji practice community is very grateful and he volunteers uh, regularly at Open Arms and at Second Harvest Heartland to feed those in need. So thank you very much for offering to speak to us today, Rushin, and I will invite this over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Am I loud enough? Okay, today, um, people familiar with my talks know that they tend to be pretty darn ambitious. So I kind of doubt that this is gonna fit into half an hour. So today um, I'd like to talk about the 87th case of the Blue Cliff Record. Medicine and disease subdue each other. This is a, um, from Yun Men, just the case is Yun Men teaching his community said, medicine and sickness subdue each other. The whole earth is medicine. What is yourself? So Yun Men is kind of popular in the, in the Blue Cliff record, 18 of the 100 cases deal with Yun Men. And I think it's because he has these little, these are little, like two sentence, three sentence little stories. So um, medicine and sickness subdue each other is the most common translation, but there's other translations which are interesting as well. So medicine and sickness correspond to each other, cure each other, fit each other, appropriate each other, subdue each other, annihilate each other. I, I first ran into this quite a while ago and it's come up again for me because of this idea of the whole earth is medicine. And from what we studied with karma, there's also this wholeness with karma. This whole history of the earth is our karma. We are that karma. It's not karma isn't something we have. Karma is something we are. So there's this wholeness of the whole earth is medicine, but the whole history of earth is also our karma in a very manifested in a very personal way. So um, that's, that's the theme I want to go with. <laughs> we, may, we may seem to be drifting in areas as usual, but it's all related. So every Dharma talk, I'm told from some time ago, should, should include impermanence, interdependence, and the clarification of no self. So Yun Men makes the point of the whole earth is medicine, and then he asks, what is your self? Some, some translations say, what is your true self? And impermanence and interdependence, in some ways, are relatively easy to grasp and understand, but when we apply to them our sense of self, that's the real test, and that's very much more difficult to, uh, to get, but we're gonna try. So one way to organize this talk is to think about um, medicine and sickness, three parts. Medicine and sickness annihilate each other, and then medicine and sickness correspond to each other. And then medicine and sickness, the common translations, subdue each other. 
So the first one is um, I'm going to cover is medicine and sickness annihilate each other. So this is um, dealing with the great oxygenation event, which goes back in history quite a ways. 2.4 million billion years ago, not million, billion years ago, there was no oxygen, no free oxygen in our atmosphere on Earth. There was oxygen, and oxygen isn't created. Our supply of oxygen is pretty much fixed from, from that time. And even before that time, oxygen is only created in very hot, very large stars. So oxygen was bonded, bonded in carbon dioxide and water, H2O, H2O. So there was oxygen, but it was all bonded. There, there, was no, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. And then there was this thing called the great oxygenation event. So what happened was cyanobacteria started a protos photosynthesis. They took what was abundant, which was carbon dioxide and water, and they freed oxygen. So this is what started the whole change, this whole transformation. And one of the points of this, um, this medicine and sickness annihilate each other is that transformation is fraught with peril. <laughs> so these cyanobacteria, which is most commonly known now, we know it as blue-green algae. So these blue-green algae, most of us in Minnesota are familiar with blue-green algae because in August, a lot of lakes um, kind of get this green paint kind of look to them or they get an actual mat on uh, about four inches high. I'm very familiar with lakes that do this. Um, so we know, we know the cyanobacteria as blue-green algae. And the DNR always puts out um, warnings about don't let your dog into these lakes because it's toxic. There's toxic um, byproducts. So this is from uh, Quora, from Adam Wu, who calls himself an amateur scientist. The early earth was full of reducing agents that rapidly reacted with any free molecular oxygen and removed it from the system. So this is carbon dioxide. Vol volcanoes put out a lot of carbon dioxide. So for a long time after the advent of oxygen, oxygenic photosynthesis, the only thing that was happening was the slow production of various new metal oxides, which ultimately sank to the seat floor to create future metal deposits. So let me just say another scientist in this Gora thing says, cyanobacteria created free oxygen about 2.5 billion years ago. It is called the great oxygenation event. When it happened, oxygen was toxic for most life forms and most of them were wiped out. So you see this transformation is full of peril. <laughs> the little bacteria didn't know what they were doing. So um, they wiped out most of life on Earth. Something like 98.5% of life on Earth was wiped out by this oxygen because it's so reactive and so toxic. So for a long time, not much happened except for the um, oxygenation of metals that's we have iron oxides which are you know the iron range is full of iron, different kinds of iron oxides but the molecular oxygen slowly began to rise this was a bad thing as molecular oxygen was lethal to all living things around at that time including the first photosynthesizers so they poisoned themselves and died in mass this of course stopped further oxygen production giving time for more reducing agents to accumulate and remove that oxygen, which in turn allowed the biosphere to rebound, including the oxygenic 
photosynthesizer, which in turn caused more oxygen to be released, resulting in a repeating cycle. So I kind of like this whole idea of transformation because this is, we're in, we're in a process of transformation. So you see that this isn't a, this isn't a simple linear progression. This is cyclic and it's, it's messy. It's very messy. The result of this is oxidized mineral deposits, mostly containing iron formed in bands. These used banded iron formations would become prominently recognizable to future paleontologists and mineral prospectors, providing humans with both the evidence to tell what happened and a major source of iron ore for industry. Then some organisms, including some of the first photosynthesizers, evolved resistance to molecular oxygen. When this happened, the negative feedback loop controlling oxygen production via the toxicity of oxygen to the critters making the stuff ended. Further oxygen production was now constrained. Oxygen levels leapt, free oxygen levels leapt to the atmosphere to about from zero to 1%. So it's still not much. It's still not much at all. But this was very bad news for almost everything living except that tiny handful of oxygen resistant lineages. So here he says over 98.5% of Earth's biological productivity may have been snuffed out. In the aftermath, the oxygen resistant survivors inherited the earth. Some of them found a new evolutionary opportunity to actually use oxygen in respiration to generate energy. Oxygen's very reactivity, the thing that made it lethal, also made it an excellent reagent for respiration. Oxygen respiration became by far the most powerful of all the available energy producing mechanisms for life on earth. This is basically how we produce energy. We call it burning calories. Why do we call it burning calories? Because oxygen is involved in our respiration. One of the things that happened with um, the beginnings of these people who were people, animals that were doing respiration was that they could start to eat the, the, the plants that were doing photosynthesis. So this kind of created another cycle of a balance between things. This in turn produced a new balance that kept oxygen levels in check as oxygen produced in photosynthesis now gets consumed on equal measure when the photosynthesizers get eaten and digested by an oxygen respirizing grazer. Oxygen levels would remain at 1% for over a billion years. So then there's other, there's an ice age there's this, there's that, there's it. oxygen levels rise to 10%. Oxygen levels rise. Currently, oxygen levels are 21%. So this isn't just a story of transformation. This is a story of our karma. This is a story of who we are. We're oxygen breathers. We are in touch with this transformation every time we breathe. So photosynthesis is basically you take what was abundant in the world at that time, carbon dioxide and water. Some, some cell decided, I'm gonna take what's abundant and I'm gonna fool around. I'm gonna try something. Photosynthesis started. Carbon dioxide and water and light energy of a certain type produces glucose. People who respirate, it's, just the complementary molecular reaction. We have glucose in our system. We take in oxygen. We release what? Water vapor and carbon dioxide. There's this balance. These little cyanobacteria didn't know what they were doing. They weren't thinkers. We're supposedly thinkers. We're supposed to be knowing what we're doing. We're supposed to be doing something for the keep, maintain the balance of the planet. We'll just see if that's gonna happen or not with climate change because it's not working out very well right now. So this is, this in some ways, this is 
medicine and sickness annihilate each other because when the cyanobacteria started, they basically wiped themselves out. They weren't conscious. They didn't know what they were doing. They tried something. This is what happened. Now we breathe. And as we breathe, every breath, we're in touch with this great oxygenation event from 2.4 billion years ago. My wife used to say, um, when we have water in a bottle, she would say, well, I don't want any of that old water. And I would think, what water isn't old? Oh, she wanted fresh water. Okay, There's, all water is old. All oxygen is old. We're part of that evolution of breathing old oxygen. Part two. Medicine and sickness correspond to each other. So Lee Lewis um, has had pancreatic cancer. He's probably cancer free right now, but he took a very wide view. He says, how could people have expectations that you're gonna hate the cancer? But Lee had this wonderful and and difficult realization that his cancer was part of his genetic makeup. His genetic makeup had this proclivity to create cancerous cells, but his genetic makeup also had this genetic makeup, this proclivity to do all the wonderful things that had were in his, in his history. So that's a very difficult and wide realization. The immune system basically has the same issue, if you want to call it an issue, but they have the same perspective. Research indicates that white blood cells, our immune system, will often gather around a tumor, but won't engage, they won't attack. Why is this? It's because the genetic material of the tumor cells isn't all that different. The white blood cells, the immune system realizes something is wrong, something is not right here, but they won't engage because it's not all that foreign. It's not foreign enough for them to go forward and engage and, at and attack the cancerous cells. So as explained to me, the immune system has a gas pedal and a brake pedal. So the gas pedal is what brings the immune system awareness to a site. The brake pedal is what holds it back from, from um, actually engaging. The current, a lot of um, recent research into cancer treatments deal with um, the immune system, because the immune system is much better at dealing with this as a than the whole idea of chemo knocking off all new new cells. It's it's chemo actually comes very close to killing people sometimes. The immune system is much more selective, but the immune system is confused. That's why cancer is such a quiet thing. It just it it's working and the immune system is confused by the system. But there's a, so the immune, the breakthroughs in cancer research now have to, the early ones have to do with dealing with this gas pedal and this brake pedal. So a, a friend of mine went through um, a cancer treatment where he, there's, he had two immune, um, immune medicines. So one was to, um, to encourage the gas pedal. And this, this actually is Optivo, which gets um, advertised on television. Optivo um, is, is kind of a gas pedal um, immune system medicine. And in this small print or in the, in the quick things, the disclaimer, the Optivo may, uh, may end up um, attacking your major organs. And this is because there's too much gas pedal. And so that's, that's 
things are out of balance when that happens. When when the my friend had this other um, immune system thing, which basically took the foot off the brake pedal and caused the um, cancer cells to be engaged by the immune system. So there's a gas pedal and a brake pedal. More recent um, cancer research, cancer treatment research, requires very, very personal um, sampling. They take a sample of the cancer, they take a sample of your immune system, and they train your immune system to recognize the protein layer that the cancer cells are producing. So it's very, very personal. And it's it's been very effective with cancers that are very hard to treat, that don't have a kind of a site, that don't have a tumor. So they it's like blood cancers that are spread throughout, but that but they can be trained. But the FDA had a hard time knowing what to do with this because it's not a, it's not a generic treatment. It's not. It's very very hyper personal. It's 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 focused. It's individualized for every patient. But this is this is basically training the immune system to recognize what's cancerous and this paying attention this recognition this is this is the key when the immune system can see the cancerous cells for what they are see the sickness for what it is that's medicine this is correspondence this is medicine and sickness correspond to each other the genetic material corresponds to each other but we still have to be able to recognize what it is so this is where, um, and this is hyper-personal in these very effective treatments. So we're in a very similar condition in a way that we don't always recognize what is sickness. We don't always recognize what is suffering. We don't always recognize what is um, separation. So here's a little piece from uh, the vice president of um, San Francisco Zen Center. The, the piece was titled, um, Zen Practice is, is uh, Difficult and Dangerous. <laughs> difficult and Dangerous. We've seen how transformation is difficult and dangerous. This is a little over-dramatization, but she makes her point. The world we live in and the very nature of our mind push us to stay self-focused and self-protective. We are encouraged to widen our stance in the world by accumulating material goods and by pushing away people who are not like us. We live our lives in a constant state of concern that our objects will disappear and our territory will be infringed. Looking over our domain, we take even a moment to assess the effects of this strategy. It might become clear that these activities do not bring about a happy, fulfilling life. We may notice that the practice of acquisition is endless that there is never enough. We start to wonder, does it need to be this way? This is medicine and sickness subdue each other. Since our minds are forever looking to control any given situation in a fruitless attempt to minimize or erase the causes of pain and maximize or permanently establish what is pleasurable, the mind might be willing to make some minor adjustments but it basically wants us to maintain the habits that have made us miserable. And the mind fights really hard for its self-oriented ways. We've seen the transformation. We don't know the effects of the transformation. This is why it's somewhat fearful, this transformation path that we're on. We, we're, we're willing to make minor changes, but really big changes, but, but um, transformation, there's a wholeness to it that can't be denied. So um, my take is that medicine and sickness are highly personal. Your karma, my karma, very, very different. But we do establish 
we do link up with enough <laughs> history that we can actually communicate in some ways and offer generic kind of solutions. But the actual implementation of those solutions is very, very personal. Buddha was often characterized as the great physicians. So um, Vasubandhu, that they're studying at uh, Paya right now, Vasubandhu starts <clears throat> as 30, vase, 30 verses of transformation. The second verse mentions the ripening of karma. So we studied karma in... Uh, I studied karma with uh, Kikan, who did the, the book that we all had in um, practice period. And, and then we did a week of looking at karma at, in practice period. Kadagiri Roshi says, Buddha's karma is actual practice you have to do. Buddha's karma is actual practice you have to do. And, and the, the thing that we, the thing we read every night, we recited every night, the arhat said, the arhat did what had to be done, and did what had to be done. Dokai quoted a couple of weeks ago that um, from one of Category's books that I couldn't find it, but that Buddhism, unlike other religions, is not about concepts or beliefs, it is about activity. We even have a bodhisattva of activity that we mentioned in the, in the um, meal, meal chants, Samantapadra. Samantapadra has 10 vows. If you look at those 10 vows, you can see why he's, he's busy. He's preserving the Buddha Dharma. So what is our activity as Buddhist Zazen practitioners is practicing Zazen? and things come up, it's the ripening of karma. And basically, this is where we have some information about self, but it's also impermanence and interdependence. And, and it's pretty clear we, we know about impermanence and interdependence from the great oxygenation event. So things come up in Zazen. Things came up, a lot of things came up during practice period. Memories, memories, memories. It was unbelievable. So completely, no one controls this. This is, this is category Roshi. Completely, no one controls this. If we, had a, if we had a self, don't you think we'd be able to say, oh, please stop. But no, these are, these are independent processes. I live in a house that has a furnace, has a refrigerator, has a water softener, has a water heater. I'm not controlling these processes. They're autonomous, but they are related to me. They're somewhat independent of me, but they are related to me. I also live in a body, in a mind that has autonomous processes that bring up things like memories, that bring up the ripening of karma. I can't control it. I can be there when it happened, but I can't control it. I can't try to deny it, that that seems to be a bad way. I can't try to hold on to it. That seems to be not useful. I can be there when it happens. We can't stop the ripening of karma because our past was naturally chock full of greed, anger, and delusion. And the greatest delusion is we can hold on to things that we like and we can push away things that we don't like. From the Pali Kanon, it says, karma accumulated will not become extinct as long as the result has not been experienced. Karma accumulated will not become extinct as long as the result has not been experienced. This seems to be a paradox, doesn't it? That we're supposed to be calm and, and clear in Zazen, 
but how are we supposed to experience the ripening of karma? Well, the idea in my mind is if you're calm and clear, then when it comes up, you experience it in ways that you wouldn't if you were distracted by the, your storytelling and your narrative or getting caught up in your reactivity to it. You just let it happen. Karma ripens and things come up and they won't become extinct until the result is fully experienced. So we practice renunciation over and over. So we can maintain a calm presence to witness things that come up and not get caught in reactivity or distraction. We want to be there when karma ripens. And there was a lot of ripening. That was great. So, so we say, let go. But I, I've kind of, kind of given up on letting go. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of more inclined these days to set aside because letting go implies that this is going to be gone and gone for good. And that just doesn't happen. But I can set things aside. So if I'm in Zazen and things come up, I can say, um, I'm going to set that aside. My grocery list, I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to trust, trust in mind that I'm going to remember. I'm going to write it down at some point, but not right now. I'm going to set it aside. So long ago, before we had voicemail, before we had texting, before we had email, before we had direct messaging, if a phone would ring and we wouldn't get back we wouldn't get to it. We would say, if it's important, they'll call back. This is what happens. If it's important, it'll call back. So that's why I say, set aside. If it's important, it'll call back. Over and over, certain calls come back. And over and over, we set them aside. We let them go. There's no self to control the process. We can witness the process. But you think, oh, what, why, why? But there is something that happens. There is something that happens in its transformation. There is the potential for transformation. You can say, oh, it's you again. <laughs> This is familiar, but to feel the ripening of karma as conditional, to feel it as not fixed, to feel that your response to it can change, to feel it as conditional, this is, this is conditioned. This is, this is, puts a whole new perspective on it. It's not, it's not as harmful. So this is the, I'm going to read from uh, what we studied at practice period. It's karma is energy, emptiness, the last couple paragraphs. This is your karma. So if you carried your own karma, which exists at the bottom of your mind, this is also the bottom of your mind is sometimes storehouse consciousness, Alea whatever. Completely no one controls this, but they are very quiet. If you don't fight with them, if you say, I'm a bad boy, bad karma, that is really fighting. Or if you say, I have good karma, etc., this is really fighting. Whatever, whatever you try to fight, the karma you have carried is completely stored in a big storage, and the doors are closed. There is nothing to fight. If you continue to fight with it, you are exhausted. It's sort of like you're fighting with a giant pillar. The pillar doesn't say anything. You just exhaust yourself. This is the karma you have carried since the beginningless past. But most people never understand this. People try to put a certain label on it as good or bad, but I don't think so. That's why today I told you that karma is understood as a great source of energy. That is a constant process itself, function itself, that's the energy you have 
by which you can create time and occasion and conditions under which certain karma comes up, just like a bubble. The doors open and a bubble comes up saying, hello, Katagiri. That is really a surprise at that time. Oh, this is Katagiri, my goodness. He laughs in either the good sense or the evil sense. If I give a talk like this, I always prepare before the lecture so I can know what I should talk about. But in the process of talking, sometimes I realize a completely different category. It's very surprising to see myself. Oh, this is category, my goodness, in both good sense and bad sense. So if you see that you are really nothing but this great source of energy, creating the time and occasion and conditions, then you can create your own world. You never can change personality or heredity or etc. In a broad sense, you cannot change you because you are you already. But what can you change? You can change time, occasion, and conditions by your own effort. What kind of conditions do you want? If you hate Sazen, you can create a condition of hate. But right in the middle of hate, still there is the chance to create love of Sazen. This is condition. Anytime, anywhere, you can get into the world to live. This is a great source of energy, understood as karma, which is called emptiness. So all this karma, this ripening of karma, we th it's not good or bad, it just is. And it brings us to this present moment where we can pivot. We can pivot one way or another. We can say, create better conditions. We can create things we want to live with. Your karma is the whole earth, and the whole earth is medicine. Angjur says, not a single atom opposes you. And I, I brought this up before, but I, I love it so much. When uh, Kathy Fisher, great teacher in her own right, married to Norman Fisher. And she, her rakasu, Mel Weitzman from Berkeley Zen Center. When a fish enters the flowing stream, everything is provided. The whole earth is medicine. Everything is provided. Kathy Fisher goes on to say, our practice is to return to our life as it is, to let our judgments fall away and to recognize the preciousness of each moment of our passing lives. So this is, this is a view of transformation. This is a view of taking our karma as, as not good or bad, but just is and having the moment to be able to transform it. So that's my talk. Actually, that was pretty good time. If there's comments and questions, I'll, uh, I'll do my best. You should probably take my uh, my thoughts on cancer research with a little grain of salt because I'm not a cancer researcher. This is the story I tell myself about it. So. Uh, thanks, Rishan. Uh No question, but I uh, just wanted to Thank you for that uh, talk. Uh, it's a refreshing uh, view on karma and Sazen that I uh, hadn't really thought of before. So it's given me, <laughs> given me a lot to think about. People always say that when I give a talk, you've given me a lot to think about. <laughs> Yeah, I've been thinking about it for a while myself. So.
we talked about renunciation. I, I tried to find the, the part about um, that I thought I knew from Martine Batchelor in this book, What Is This? And I looked through the whole book and I couldn't find it, but basically she's saying, you know, at any given time in Zazen, we have a decision point. We can either go with this thought that comes up or feeling that comes up and see, see it to its end, or we can set it aside. So the idea is in her mind, and return to what she calls the anchor, which is our breath. And our breath is basically tied to this great oxygenation event from way long ago. But the idea is, this is our Zazen practice, is re the renunciation, is the setting aside. Things are going to come up. Karma is going to ripen. So we, we'd like to think Zazen is just this one thing, but we're going to be calm and peaceful and it's going to be wonderful. But no, everything comes up. But the coming up, how you deal with that, that's the Zazen practice. It's fraught with peril. <laughs> Rujan-san, thank you for the talk. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the the set it aside, and if it's important, it'll call back. <laughs> I really, I appreciate that phrase. And um, I uh, just, I, I, I appreciate Samanta Bahadra and those those ten vows and and um, repentance and. Uh, um, uh what's the the our um refuges and all those verses kind of coming from that and i'm kind of blanking a little bit but i'm i'm wondering if uh if you could just uh maybe say a little bit about your um view of repentance and um and uh yeah how repentance kind of kind of works um, along with, golly, I'm blanking out. What are our first, Dokai, what are our first, um, the, uh, the first chance that we do in the morning? Oh, well, my ancient <clears throat> twisted karma. Yes. Yes. So that, how that works in with repentance and I, I'm just blanking out on the names of that, um, those vows. The last, can you hear me okay? Everyone hear me? Okay. So uh, the last one is I, well, my favorite translation is I make full open confession of it, all the evil ants. But we don't say that. We say I, we hear, the new translation is we say that uh, we um, uh, fully, what do we we fully atone a vow or a vow it or something like that? So yeah, now so fully, just, fully a vow, fully a vow or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, it's just I think it means we 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 we're doing our best to just fully recognize it. And I, my, I'll just add a comment. Um, I was struck by your um, statement. Rushin, where you said karma will not be extinguished until the result is experienced. And for me, that's uh, very, very important. I'll have to ask you where you saw that in the Nikayas. In any event, it's, it just seems to me like the purpose, if you want to call it purpose, of karma is just to experience it. You have to, and it's hugely, or it can be quite painful to realize all how much uh, ignorance you've been living in. And well, we just have to experience that. And also all the pain you've created by your egotistic world that we're living in. So every morning, th those are, we've uh, modified our morning service every now and then, but those are the things I want to repeat. Those verses are the things I always want to repeat three times because um, I don't think we get it the first time we say it. So, 
even on a microscopic level. We need to like just really contemplate what that is. Um, all the ancient twisted karma that I have um, created through my body, speech, and mind through uh, something like uh, from the beginning, beginningless time. So that kind of refers to what uh, I think also Rushan was uh, talking about. We don't, we can't uh, know the beginning of it. It's not something conceptual. It's not like it didn't begin with us thinking about it. So it's something uh, far beyond that. <clears throat> Rushan, do you have any comment on what I said? I I got that quote from the Holly Cannon from somebody who quoted it in a talk. So I don't know where it comes from. Okay. A lot of a lot of my stuff just comes floating through, you know. So mm. but it's interesting because I'm not sure I karma accumulated will not become extinct as long as the result has not been experienced. I'm not sure it ever becomes extinct. I think our relationship to it transforms. It's not, and I think that's what repentance is about, is about changing our relationship to our, to the selfish things we've done in the past and, and repenting those selfish things. We, we realize this whole idea of recognition is, is like, it's so important to recognize what, I mean, that's that's the delusion is the not recognizing that that this that the way of life that we're always taught to be to accumulate things to protect ourselves this is a this is a this is not it's, it's harmful but the other thing that gets me in in this whole thing is these these little cyano bacteria they had no idea what they were doing they didn't realize they were going to kill themselves off but yet there's this you know Gadagiri talks about energy a lot in these karma talks and it's like these little guys had this energy to try something and they took over the world they covered the earth with the with these but then they killed themselves off but they had no idea that was the consequence Somehow, we're supposed to be smarter than that. We're supposed to see the consequences of our actions. But it's like this energy is still there. This energy in even these single-celled little tiny creatures. They just want to live. Jushin, I'm going to add a, Rushin, I'm going to add a comment that... Uh... You mentioned that the balance of the planet will happen. And I believe that's absolutely true. And that's not a problem for the universe. <laughs> the universe will uh, just keep balancing itself out, depending on if there's a little green algae happening here and other conditions happen. It'll just it just kind of reacting to each other without any kind of thinking going on. And I would say, of course, the universe is going to keep in balance. Uh, maybe our problem with human beings is the universe doesn't really care what happens to, to us as human beings. And that's where the, the rub is. We think, well, wait a minute. We want our species to you know, last forever. Um, but you know, a lot of, like you say, 98.5% of the life at one point in time was just wiped out and because of some, uh, something that happened. And uh, of course, we as human beings think we're we're smarter and we can get in control of it. Uh, but I'm not so sure about that. I'll just add another comment. Also, you said uh, a Dharma talk should include three things. One was impermanence and one was no self. Do you remember the third one? Interdependence. Interdependence. Let me write that so down. We, we, we can know about interdependence every time we breathe. <laughs> okay. Uh, then, also, I, I heard a talk by another person giving what a Dharma talk should include, and they said, 
and make absolutely sure you end on a happy, positive, encouraging note in the Dharma talk. So uh, I think that's an important point too. And, uh, oh, I do have a lot to talk about today, but I, I'll try to edit myself um, out. Last night, uh, three of our younger, or two of our, our younger residents went to a movie, 2001, with uh, one of the residents' friends. 2001, made in 1968 by Stanley Krebeck. And I, I feel that movie is about transformation. And no one actually knows how or why, but the last scene is this embryo looking, a beautiful embryo looking at the whole earth, you know, and it's, I think, a symbol of the world will transform again by a different kind of mind or circumstances or whatever. And that movie's 56 years old, but it, it still holds some value to me. Last thing I'll say is, yes, I have appreciated for a long time in our meal chant where we say, on Jews reads the, you know, wisdom, Bodhisattva wisdom, Avalokitejvara is compassion, but Sambo, Samapatabra is, well, there's got to be action with the compassion and the wisdom. So that's in the middle of the two of them. So I really, really have appreciated that over a long time period of time. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. That's that's become more and more important to me as well for you know um Frank Ostaseski leads things at Upaya and he always he always breaks people into small groups and then we read the five remembrances. And it's like, oh yeah, things are gonna really fall apart. But then there's a hopeful note at the end where it says my actions are my only refuge. My actions. So it's like this is this is the activity. This is what you do with once you recognize, then you have to act. So if if someday maybe I'll do the ten vows of Samantapadra, but like I said, if you read this ten vows, you can see why he's so busy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, for fleshing that out. And thank you, Dokai, for um, kind of refining that. I think, uh, yeah, here lately, I'm kind of um, trying to uh, make a little more clear my understanding of um, like the this practice and my um, very new practice of being a very new, um, you know, uh, ordained person, priest, whatever, um, and how to, how to, um, understand the trappings of my, uh, previous religious background and what I'm doing now and why that is so, um, why it's gripped me in the way that it has. And so I think, yeah, these conversations are just really helpful and I really appreciate them how to, you know, what, um, what, what repentance is. It, it, and what for for us for this uh, for this practice for for this tradition and um how to how to embody and convey that you know um and it all it just seems like you know samanta bahadra is is the thing it is it is the act of doing those things and um yeah so so thank you i i will say that um Kikan and I are in correspondence all the time, and, and he's, he told me um, the conclusion of these karma talks from the karma book, the concluding one, the last page category mentions repentance. So you may want to check that out. It's, it, it's definitely related to relinquishment. And, and I, I did run across a quote from uh, Suzuki Roshi talking about um, renunciation. Renunciation, repentance, it's 
they're closely related, but he's saying it's not something that's, it's basically just accepting that this is the way that things are impermanent, that this is, things are moving on. It's not something we impose on anything. It's more like we're accepting the way things are. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. That's what that's the word I was trying to remember is renunciation versus repentance. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, maybe does anyone who hasn't spoken have uh, any comment? I think Tenru's raising her hand. Thank you. I just want to, Rishan, thank you for your Dharma talk. And it's always helpful. I know, Dokai, you've done this in way past talks to broaden the horizon of um, my consciousness because it gets bound by um, the newspaper headlines and worries about the planet and people. And this is <laughs> this cyanobacteria destroying themselves. It just gives me perspective on my little life and my little actions and that paradox of it's it's big and it's little at the same time. So I appreciate all of this discussion. What I like is it's not far from us. I mean, every breath we're engaged in this, this huge history. Life is fragile. <laughs> just one more i can't help but commenting but because uh, this is very stimulating for me but uh so i think when we ordain we are, we're taking up the path of renunciation and uh let's just let's not let's forget about leaving family leaving home and all that let's just Say, what can we do in Zazen? It's renunciation. Just that tiny little place. And for me, that's just what you were speaking about today, uh, Rushin, where you said, you know, when something comes up in Zazen, we can either like just set it aside. And that's for me is renunciation. You're not going to chase after it or block it away. Renunciation is just setting it aside, you know, and neither rejecting nor chasing after it we can just keep it at that and that's a pretty simple but really hard practice and just start from there and that's uh, might be the way we solve the whole problem or we can contribute to solving the problem of the whole universe or at least our human world let's put it that way i'm not sure the universe has a big problem but uh all right we are i, I taken up the last of our time here. Um, so, Rushin, thank you very much. I'm not going to say you've given me a lot to think about. I'll say this is a very stimulating talk, and I'm very happy that you presented this to me, to us. <clears throat> Upcoming events, um, we have a Tenzo class, Kyokin, um, how to uh, cook in the kitchen. Basically speaking, it has different, lots of different translations. I think this will be the third week on Tuesdays. Um, I haven't really checked the, the leadership. I'm not participating in that class. If if you can join, you know, in um, at a certain time, maybe I should check on that before I announce it. But anyway, this I believe this is the third week they're meeting, and they go for um, uh, for eight weeks. And it start, it's on Tuesdays from 6.30 to 8. On April 6th, we have the annual meeting. It will be uh, held uh, physically in Minneapolis, but it'll also be offered online as well. And it's on uh, yeah April 6th. Um, I think uh, I'm going to say the time is around 1 o'clock for the annual meeting, but I'm not absolutely sure if that's the exact time or not. Uh, for 11, April 11th, we have a Caring for the Land and Work Weekend. We uh, come here, we take care of our land, and we work together. And 
we pull out a winter and go into spring, basically, and uh, with our work. Um, so, and it's free. We feed you for your work. You know, we don't pay you a lot of money, but you get free food. And usually it's pretty good. So, contemplate on coming down for a day or two days or three days, whatever. We'll gladly um, um, accept your presence. And uh, just for your information, next week's speaker is a Shoto Spring, and after Shoto is myself. And then you can check the um, uh, Hokyoji website for speakers in May. So that's it for today. Um, as you're all aware, we are all always appreciative of any contributions, uh, donations uh, you can offer to Hokyoji. That's uh, how we sustain ourselves for the most part. We'll close with the four vowels and let me... Excuse me, got to change my, okay. <clears throat> Beans are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable, I vow to realize it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good uh, week. Hope to see you next week and take good care. Bye-bye.